therapist or as the person who goes crazy every two Wednesdays uh, for this program. recently, before Butte, I moved here from East Tennessee. Uh, we moved there when I was 12, so I spent about 20 years in Oak Ridge. My dad was a, a nuclear safety engineer. Um, as most of my high school friends, their parents were, all of our dads worked out of the lab, um, somewhere in the nuclear industry or in um, uh, biology, physics, things like that. Uh, so like I said, I grew up in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where you can grow anything. I literally took a small patch of irises in my little house there, and I only had about a dozen blooms because they were all matted up, broke them up, got busy, ignored them for two years, needed that box back, so I took it and just tossed it up on the side of my hill, and wouldn't you know, the next spring I had 120 blooms that I counted. The ones I started, the first 12 were pale purple, which is kind of a standard East Tennessee iris. Uh, I think it's the state, state flower. I had two shades of red, two shades of yellow, two shades of purple, and white, and maybe even an orange or misty one. So um, that is how easy gardening is in, in East Tennessee. You just have to like, Think about your garden and things will grow. So when I moved to Butte in 1999, I arrived here on a very bright day um, in February, on February 1st, <laughs> and it was very cold. And I had a little house up on Copper Street, and uh, it wasn't until April or May that I realized that in the back, I did not have a yard, I had a little uh, paved patio, which was lovely. I didn't know what was going to be back there. Um, so I thought I will garden in, in the front yard. But I always like to wait and see what's going to come up. Wait a year, let's see what's going to come up. Um, so the next March, I got out there with my, uh, my shovel, that had been my grandfather's, and uh, got in there and about broke my knee and ankle. Because in March, even if it's sunny out, uh, and the weather, this was probably the first warm day I had seen in you. Um, in March, it's still frozen. And I didn't know the ground could freeze. <laughs> so, um, so that was my introduction to gardening. And it was in Butte. And um, it was about five years before I was able to kind of calm that inner clock that said, get out and garden. So um, now I wait till after Memorial Day because I know if you put anything in the ground, it will freeze. Um, I tried to tell a friend that who insisted on planting peppers and tomatoes in uh, my little house down on Burlington, and it was like May 20th. And I said, they're going to freeze. I don't know why we're doing this. They're going to freeze. <coughs> oh, they'll be fine. You live in those. They'll be fine. No, they're not. They're going to freeze. <coughs> Guess what? They froze. We had to replant them. And I said, see, I told you, you have to wait until June 1st or June 6th, even better. Um, so that is my experience with um, a southern gardener trying to grow things here in view. So um, today we're going to learn about how hard it was to grow things beginning about 1890, 1895. <coughs> uh, I'm going to organize this presentation around three themes. What did I do with my clicker? Did I leave it over there? Oh, here it is. I can't even see. Three things. Oh, yeah. Flowers, club women, 
and Fuchs. Although I should say they're not all women in the in the clubs. Um, but uh, How to Grow Flowers, the clubs that grew up around gardening in Butte, and Fruits in Butte. But we can't talk about gardening in early Butte without talking about the air quality here. Boy, that slide is dark. Okay. Um, this is Butte in 1881. Y'all have probably seen this um, before. We use this a lot, or people use this one a lot. And um, if, you could, if it was a little brighter in here, you'd see a lot of smoke and haze back here. <coughs> And here's um, the, another part. I think this might be just like the left-hand side of that same picture, possibly. And you see the source of that haze and smoke here. I think that is the Colorado smelter. Uh, feel free to correct me if I have my location wrong. But I think that's the Colorado uh, skelter. Shut up. Helter skelter. That's what I feel like today. <laughs> um, so we can see the sources of, of, the, of the smoke. There was a lot of smoke in Butte, and it was created by two things, coal smoke and metallurgical smoke. We had both of them here. Uh, these are the Sanborn maps of um, the, actually the smelters. We've got the Parrot smelter here, and I think this is the Colorado up there. And I can't quite read that, it's a little bit blurry, but um, uh, a lot of, a lot of things in here to produce smoke. So we've got two types of smoke shown here. Uh, like I said, you've got, um, and I don't know which is which, I'm gonna say the dark one is the coal smoke, and maybe the lighter one is the metallurgical smoke, but really all of it has particulates in it that rain down upon the valley, and according to oral and written histories and hearsay, not a blade of grass could be seen in Butte. So, in 1891, um, Mrs. Jessie Knox arrived. She was a very young widow, and she became known as the mother of all gardens in Butte. She was told that the ground had been so poisoned with the deposit of smoke and silt from the mines and smelters that nothing could possibly grow here. In a newspaper article in 1918, she recalled looking back, I shook my finger in the faces of those who told me, hi Jim. Sorry, Emily. Who told me, you missed all the excitement. You only really missed this much of it. <laughs> um, she said, I shook my finger in the faces of those who told me, who told me that and said I could make things grow here and would. As a young widow, she invested her savings uh, and opened the Inverness Greenhouse in 1892 on a bit of property listed only as two miles south of Butte in the city directory. The greenhouse contained 10,000 feet of glass and was located on a three-cornered lot on Florence Avenue. So we have Harrison Avenue here, and here's Florence Avenue up here. Over here is the, um, I think this is Marsha Street. So this is the number two firehouse. This is the now the corner bookstore. This is Glacier Bank, which just got a new facelift uh, with its drive through and everything. So that's the corner. And this is the old Harrison Avenue Theater, which uh, is now Great Harvest. So that gives you an idea of where her greenhouse was um, in the Inverness greenhouse. Um, she started slowly by planting trees on her lot and indoors growing the first geraniums, then chrysanthemum, chrysanthemums, and carnations. No one believed anything beautiful could come out of Butte, at least at that time. And in 1896, she exhibited, I'm sorry, I think that's a typo, 1893, she exhi exhibited 25 varieties of chrysanthemums, all grown in her greenhouse. Soon she raised enough money to plant a rose garden and demonstrated that roses too could be grown in Butte. She gave all of her roses away to all visitors to her Inverness greenhouses, a precedent she set for her development of the Rose Garden of Hospitality at the Panama California Exposition in California. So she operated the hospitality garden in uh, 1912 at the exposition. In 1893, she sponsored the first flower show in Butte, featuring 
chrysanthemums. Where Butte residents previously had purchased flowers only for weddings and funerals, Knox start, created a market for homegrown flowers to be placed in gardens. She owned a floral business on Granite Street. She was the first florist in Butte. And the greenhouses in Inglewood until she departed Butte for California in 1910. It wasn't until 1921 that Butte would see another garden show organized. So sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce, which is eager to show that Butte was greening up now that copper was smelted in Anaconda. I don't know if you could grow things in Anaconda after that. That's a whole other issue. This show looks like it was probably focused on um, Butte's gardens, outdoor gardens in their yards. That same year saw the creation of the Rocky Mountain Garden Club. So the Garden Club was, um, I gotta read this, I didn't transfer this one over, uh, was established in 1921 largely through the leadership of Ella Higgins and a group of garden enthusiasts, enthusiasts and bird lovers. Um, like garden clubs today, they provided education, resources, networking opportunities for the members uh, to promote the love of gardening, floral design, as well as civic and uh, environmental responsibility. Um, the Rocky Mountain Garden Club promoted city cleanup days and they promoted the improvement of public spaces through plantings and gardens. So a lot of the um, individual clubs I cannot find a color of font where you can read this. I think I need to change the slide. Um, a lot of these clubs were focused around schools. So they would adopt a school, and then they would um, uh, landscape the school. And they would also get the children involved. Um, so there were, um, each club had its own flower. Um, gosh, I cannot even read that. It looked fine on my computer. <laughs> Uh, like the Inglewood Emerson Club adopted the calendula as their club flower. Uh, the Columbine, big surprise, adopted the Columbine for their flower. Delphiniums represented the uh, Atherton Club, and so on and so on. There were also children's clubs, um, and a lot of them were boys' clubs. Uh, in addition to this one is the Mount Vern Boys uh, Junior Garden Club. Boys formed the Bachelor Buttons, Redwoods, East Butte, those boys had no imagination, the Willing Workers, and the Sequoia. The girls' clubs organized the Busy Bee Group, the Marigolds, and Lovers of Nature. And uh, the last group that was mentioned, in, at least in 1939, in an article I found, was the Buttercups. And the Buttercups were the only group of mixed boys and girls. So as you see, they had little projects. They have just completed building birdhouses. Um, and they met, I forgot to write down the address, but they met, um, oops, that is not what I meant to do. The address is listed on the back of the photo, and here's the house, as it was in 1959, and it's still there. And I forget where it is, somewhere on the west side. So a little bit about Alma Higgins. A lot of people are very familiar with um, Alma Higgins. Uh, she was an author, an activist, a spiritualist. She was born in Deer Lodge, Montana in 1874. And she was married in 1899 to Warder Higgins. She was a Bielenberg, by the way. I didn't tell you that. Alma Bielenberg. Uh, big cattle family up there. Um, so Warder Higgins, her husband, was a mining engineer. Uh, she died in March 1962 here in Butte. She was instrumental in the construction of the Deer Lodge Women's Clubhouse, a pioneer in forest conservation, and was nationally known as the Christmas Tree Lady. She promoted the concept of living Christmas trees in the home and is credited with inspiring the planting of the first national Christmas tree in Washington, D.C. Uh, among the founders of the Rocky Mountain Garden Club in Butte, she formed the Floral Art Division of that club and the Wildflower Preservation Society. She designed and maintained a public garden next to the old First Presbyterian Church in Butte and an experimental alpine garden in the Tobacco Root Mountains. She was also a member of the Sons and Daughters of Montana Pioneers. So. Um, 
This is the side of the, of the old Presbyterian Church, which is now um, the theater. Um, so if you were standing in the public library, you look out on this parking lot right here. But there are a few little traces up here. And rumor has it the library would like to secure permission to kind of reconstruct at least parts of this garden. And this was a rest area that, um, you know, that was built, and then she designed all the gardens around it to make it a friendly place. There, there's a plaque in her honor on that wall. There is. There is. I think that's how people identified, like, oh, this is Alma's. Um, so I think that would be a great project. Um, so Alma even showed that you can indeed grow flowers even in the mine yard. This is the home of E.M. Norris, the superintendent of the Leonard Mine. And I'm thinking this was made in 1921 because this is one of Alma's hand-colored slides. Um, she had lantern slides that we have in our collection. And she hand-colored all of these. So the way they're identified, I think she put together a slideshow like this. Is that for, in view? Is that, in view? that is in view. It's probably down on flat. I think it's in view. I would assume it is because it was for the garden show. Yeah. It was for the garden show. I like all those trees in the boulevard. I know, right? Yeah. And in 1921, obviously things were growing here by then. So these are a few examples of, um, of the slides that she hand colored. And Uptown, which we just saw, this one I'm pretty sure is on the flat somewhere, probably in Floral Park. I think this might be her house. And this, I think, is the vegetable garden located in, uh, at the superintendent's house because I think some of these buildings are back behind there. This looks like a little side yard in there. Um, and she's, look at this, she's got a nice little raised bed. So not a new concept. I know we all love having raised beds. Um, this is down by uh, Clark's Park, Texas Avenue, runs across here. And if you drive by, you can still see the remnants of, um, of this garden. Another one. This house looks really familiar to me. I think I drive by it a lot, so it's probably down on the flat. One more. One more. I've got a lot of them. And show them in flowers. Um, other things that we have here in our collections, which I just absolutely fell in love with, are um, diaries and journals. So this is the herbarium and plant descriptions. It was uh, kept by Faye Stoniker when she was 15 years old and living in Oklahoma where she was born. Now Faye uh, came to Butte, I believe she came with her parents, and she married S.J. Perry. Um, she kept, so she would go out, and again this was in Oklahoma when she was a teenager, we have this whole book filled with examples and then a whole page of a plant description. It has its common name, it has um, its Latin name, it has the family, where she found it, and so much information. The pages kind of open out like that. And just pages and pages and pages of examples of things that she collected. Um, the other journal we have in our collection is one kept by Alex Walker. Uh, Alex Walker's journal covers the, covers the years 1935 to 1954. Uh, Walker was born in Scotland in 1872. He came to Montana as a prospector and operated the smuggler mine near Sheridan in Madison County. So that was up along Mill Creek, so you probably drive along there um, if you go up to Brandon Lakes. He also held several mining claims throughout Montana and Idaho. That's kind of how he spent his time uh, developing small mine sites. His journal documents the purchase of his home at 1109 Steel Street in uh, Butte, the furnishings, and the decorating of the home. He also documents the weather daily as well as his activities um, with gardening. Um, his home maintenance and his fishing opportunities. So that's the home. Uh, he was known as a very skilled fisherman and there are detailed reports on the condition of the Big Hole River and fishing activity from 1935 to 1952. And he died in 1955 at the age of 83. Um, and I wonder if 
things like this that he detailed how fast the water was running, um, you know, what, what fish he was seeing there, if those might be handy in the future as part of environmental studies. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about vegetables, which also grow beaut. I am a flower gardener, not a vegetable gardener. Um, so Hansel Packing was very well known um, in Butte and still is in people's memories as uh, a packing house. Uh, but they also grew a lot of gardens through here. These are examples of some of their gardens. Uh, Hanson Packing was established in 1912 by Walter Hanson and a few others. Some interesting facts, Hanson's produced all of the meat requirements for Yellowstone Park concessions from 1917 until about 1951. The Horse Products Division was established in 1927, and as a result, Vitamont dog food became arguably the first canned dog food product in America. And another thing I love, oh, I guess I gotta get this one. I put this in here because I love this picture. This is one of Smithers' pictures. We have several views of this family. So I don't know where it is, but I love this because they're growing hops in the backyard, um, which is very cool. So I don't know, maybe they, maybe they were a German family that ran one of the breweries. I have no idea. but that you can go pops up on your vegetables here in Butte. And then we've got the Chinese gardens. Um, when I first moved here, people would say, oh, the Chinese gardens, they're out by the Nine Mile. They're out by the Nine Mile. Um, there are actually at least three documented locations of the Chinese gardens in Butte. They were originally uh, located across the tracks on the flat from um, about where well, about where the weed is, across from the weed, uh, from the concentrator. Uh, they had productive gardens up there in spite of the smoke and smelting pollution. Uh, residential development then moved them down to the Nine Mile. Um, actually, first, before they went to the Nine Mile, they were uh, over behind, behind where NCAT is, behind the poor farm. So there were some over there. Then they moved out to the Nine Mile. Um, they were not much on making fancy or ornamental beds or patches. Um, they, they were known to bring every bit of soil up to the highest degree of productiveness. They used hot beds and cold frames to sow seeds that were later transplanted. They grew radishes, onions, and lettuce throughout the season. And greens, turnips, beets, peas, and then later in the season, new potatoes, corn, and carrots. Potatoes grow really well here. Um, each garden employed eight men, paid about $45 monthly. And uh, so what did they do with all this, this food that they, they grew? They washed, trimmed, sorted, bundled, tied, and packed it all for market. And uh, they were known, uh, they would sell them to the markets of town because you know, as you know, every, great, every neighborhood had a little grocery store. And so the Chinese grocers would uh, sell their vegetables to the neighborhood grocery stores, even to some of the larger stores like that. Um, and partly because they were so uh, beautifully, I don't say packaged, marketed. Um, this quote from the uh, Queer Spot says, the Chinese have all of the white gardeners beaten for the painstaking care they devote to washing the vegetables, grading them uniformly, and neatly tying them into bundles is far more pleasing to the eye, and it makes it look to the housekeeper as if she were getting the worth of her money. So that's, that's all, and I just have a few slides cycling through of some of the successful gardens here in Butte. So thank you all for putting up with our, our technical difficulties. Thank you for showing up, even though I'm not Mark Johnson talking about Chinese history. But please do come back on Monday, um, May 23rd, and come see Mark. And there will also be a reception following, um, on Wednesday, following um, the brown bag up here. Well, that evening, and the brown bag up here. So, any questions or comments or anything? No? Well, thank you all for, for coming. Sorry it was so short. No, very good.
That's that's what it is. The store gardens and people. And I, I love when people say, oh, it's so hard to grow things here. And yeah. We've been doing it for 125 years now, so we can do it. Yeah, whose photo collection is that? Uh, this is Alma Higgins. The slides, the colored slides are the Alma, Alma Higgins. Um, Ellers or Smithers. Um, so, yeah, everything is from our collection. But, boy, I love the herbarium. I love reading. Uh, garden journals and things like that. I think those are really interesting, and I think they can really um, be a good a good resource as people go forth and document environmental. Yes. Um, were folks in the gardening clubs interested in wildflowers and native plants at all, or was it more? You know, I think they were because uh, it said that uh, one of the things that I read about Alma was that she did establish the wildfire fire. Well, Wildflower Preservation Society, and um, I haven't looked really, really deeply into this. I confess I put this together very quickly last year for a quick presentation at the library, and um, and then had a practice run yesterday, <laughs> and then I went, well, you all are going to stay awake <laughs> instead of the people I was talking to yesterday. Um, so I didn't, I didn't look into it, but it sure makes me want to look into, you know, what were they looking at, what were they documenting, things like that. And one thing I would like to mention too, um, a lot of people get really excited when they look at um, all the trees on the end. Oh, look at that, the trees are coming back on the end. Um, just so you all know, there never were trees. On the end. We have photos from 1890, and that is just as bare as can be. Um, when I was walking up there with my um, then husband, who went to Tech, one of his classes planted a bunch of trees as an experiment down at the base. So I think those have crept up. And of course, as all of these gardens have become more successful, more and more birds have started to come back as our environment has been healing, and birds drop seeds everywhere. And so um, I, th I think the M has become an example, not so much of, of natural recovery, but on positive influence of, um, uh, of humans on natural environment. Um, hopefully it's positive. Maybe since they weren't there, we should take them all down. No, I don't know. No, 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 I agree. No, I think we should leave them up there. I think they're lovely, as long as they don't block the M, right? <laughs> so, any other questions or comments? No? Thank you all so much for coming. And, uh, Hopefully, we can get those resolved soon. So, all right, go have it. Have a lovely sunny day. Good to see you. That's why we're using this one. And this is so cool. This is the new one. Can you see how dark it is? Did you see how dark this is? Stress. Yeah. No, it's it's Wi-Fi issues. Yeah, it's Wi-Fi issues. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with the other one. And I said, can we just get into the answer? And I might go back and just say, this is still, this is a second one we've got. That works fine. Yeah, tell her hi. Tell her I'll get her a beer for all her hard work. Yeah, we have to do that. That would be fun. Yeah. Oh, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. I know, right? I don't know. Don't plan anything. Well, there's things that you just bought me some. I can't tell if I recorded that. They just blocked in here. They blocked me in. They don't want me moving around. I love the way. Yeah.